But I, I'm pretty proud of where I came from. And so if people want to have an issue with the fact that, you know, it wasn't handed to me, then that's their issue. Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the real Bradley Bombs is dropping. What it is, Bradley, back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today, folks, in the studio, I've got a real treat for you. I'm sure you've heard of them, and you've probably even heard of her. I've got two coming at you. Now, if you've never seen the show Undercover, Undercover Billionaire, Glenn Stearns, background, founder and CEO of Kind Lending, currently star of Undercover Billionaire, won the comeback season, and the mentor on season two, cancer survivor. That's that's the biggest win of them all right mm. there. Amen. <laughs> Philanthropist, mentor, uh, uh, soon to be worldwide celebrity. Everybody knows who he is now. And he brought his better half, Mindy. Glenn and Mindy <laughs> Stearns, welcome. How you glad doing? Glad to be here. Man, I'm glad you guys are here. You We're guys in the bomb ever, zone. This is you, great. Have you ha- ever heard an episode at all? And be don't be lying. No. You didn't even hear one on no. the way here. Most people go. Yeah, I heard it because they heard it on the way here. Yes. Um, I will admit that no, I haven't. Well, dropping bombs, we're just going to sit here, shoot the shit. The, the goal of the show is ultimately to talk about, you know, whatever. And hopefully people listening might have an issue, same problem. And shit we say, solutions we talk about, help them out. That's it. Yeah. No, I had, um, when we met originally, I, I went on and I, I heard some of them. I went on and and kind of went through real quick but I never went through the whole thing but I was just trying to get a glimpse of what you do and I was like wow this is the real deal I mean I love the studio I love what you got going the depth of it so yeah no I I I did go on but again I was I was looking at all the you got a lot of guests my goodness man yeah yeah well I get I get lucky because they come in and out to film content and I just snatch them yeah good stuff impressive very impressive and now how did I find you guys someone asked me how do you get connected with these people (laughs) I'm like, well, Glenn, frick, I was just on a clubhouse. <laughs> clubhouse. Isn't that That's crazy how that is growing? I mean, that thing has grown oh, so big. Oh, my God. We've, I've probably been on it five or six times, but, I mean, Grant every time I go that. on it, it's there's just thousands, literally, of people that are on it that are all, and most of you guys, a lot of you know each other, which is really, I thought, how in the world do you know each other, but you're in this network that I didn't even know existed, you know? I mean, yeah, you well, and Grant as an example, right? Well, it's yeah, it's called kind of like the the guru. I call it the guru space, you know, the the mentoring and coaching and info products. So that's how they all know each other. They yeah, all have the events. Sense. They're all speaking on all the events, entrepreneurial events. So it's more entrepreneurial slash guru. Yeah, but you're officially uh, a guru. So all right, I'll take everyone it. should know Come who on. you are. Do I have to use that at home? I don't have to use that. No. <laughs> I become a doctor. She doesn't call me a doctor nope. yet. Nope. Yeah, he got an honorary one? doctorate from Gannon oh, University. Well, I'm an honorary police officer. There you go. Hey, so am I. So are you really? I am. So both of you in? could frisk me. Did you get sw- <laughs> Did you get sworn in? No, I got the badge. Right. So you're you're just an honorary. I'm an honorary get out of tickets person. Yeah. They the I did a keynote in Florida. There was a mayor of a small town. Part of my keynote, I told her when I was growing up. I didn't tell her. I told the audience when I was going up, I wanted to be a police officer. I got a couple DUIs or three, and oh. you know, they don't hire people with a DUI. Mm-mm. So I kind of just gave up that dream, and I always wanted to be a cop. And then I continued with my talk, and so this lady came up afterwards and she said, "Hey, how you doing? I loved your talk." I said, "Thank you." She said, "Man, I just you know loved listening to you about this and that." She goes on and on about how much she loves me. I'm like. Awesome, man. This yeah. is cool. I'm flattered. And then she said, let me ask you a question. Did you really want to be a cop? And I said, well, absolutely. She said, well, I made a phone call, and I have the ability to make you a police officer. And I said, and I'm thinking, okay, whatever. I didn't really right. you didn't know, believe it. See what was good. Where so I'm, going? I'm almost just like patronizing her. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool, yeah. And so it turns out she's the mayor of a town in California, who has the authority to deputize. So she literally called in some lady 
swore me in on film, made me sign a sworn document. She signed it and then had the police chief sign it and get, send it to me with my badge. Oh. So I know another law officer or law enforcement guy. He said, if she swore you in, like you're a straight up real police officer, like you're a, what they call a sworn officer. That's pretty. Yeah, heavy. most honorary. Yeah. They don't get sworn. Mm-mm. I got you didn't sworn. Get sworn. You got I sworn. A, we had a buddy that, that That's had impressive. A, a badge that um, on his wedding day, he got a little pissed off and he put it up to the window and pulled someone over and cussed him out and drove off and. He wasn't sworn in, and uh, <laughs> he got in a no. lot of. T- yeah, yeah. He spent so his he wedding night up, in jail. He ended up in jail for his wedding. So for impersonating uh, an officer. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> Don't mess around with but the see, badge. See, that's the thing. I am a sworn officer. You're not impersonating. You're like sworn. I am. A, I am a real deal. Although, yes, uh, you are. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't attempt to pull anyone over. Yeah. And, and, and act on anything, unless I saw somebody harming somebody. Well, so how many what, tickets has it gotten you out of? I'm just curious. You know, it's funny that you say <laughs> that because I got pulled over. You're not supposed to go, no. you're supposed to just let them see that right. you also have a badge. Right. And so I had it in my in my center console to where when I opened up my, my insurance, there it is. So I opened it up. He didn't say anything. Freaking gave me a ticket anyway. <laughs> I've had that happen a couple of times. <laughs> I've got out of most of them, but I didn't have to. Oh, gosh. Glenn had a little chemo brain last time he got pulled over. He didn't remember where he got it, what community, what county it was. <laughs> yeah, don't don't pull out your badge after having chemotherapy. Chemo. He's going, where's the badge from? Uh, I couldn't remember the name of the town. I couldn't remember. <laughs> the county. The county. The sheriff. Oh, nothing. It was horrible. He was probably thinking that you're uh, one of the, like your buddy. Yeah, uh, exactly. a, a impersonator. Yeah, I got a ticket. Well, folks, if you're not living under a rock, you probably watched Undercover Billionaire. That's Glenn Stearns. Now, they basically dropped your ass off in the middle of nowhere, Erie, Pennsylvania. Pretty much. With 100 bucks in your pocket, right? And said, let's see you build a million-dollar business in 90 days. And off you went. I watched it. If, if anyone hasn't watched it, where would they go watch right now? Uh, you can watch it on Discovery Plus. Mm-hmm. You can watch it on Hulu, I think. Um, YouTube. There's a lot of places it's on right now. Yeah, but it's a whole, it's like eight episodes. It right. shows you struggling and, and, and ending up uh, winning or losing. I won't give it up if people haven't watched. But the guy already built a massive business, and basically this was a, a, a test. Right. Right? So talk about that. Why, do you, why did you feel like, let me see if I can do it again? <laughs> well... You know, and first, how much did you sell your company to Blackstone for? Is that public? Uh, no, <laughs> a lot of money. It did, like a shit ton. Yeah, like you say shit, that in the beginning ton. of the money. I'm worth a shit ton of money, isn't that? A lot like? of money. <laughs> yeah, a lot of money, folks. So, so, and by the way, I was at dinner with these two last night. You know, I had my wife thinking we're living a life of luxury, <laughs> but they they ruined that for me. Oh no! Uh, now, now she's like, babe, how come we don't have a yacht? I want to cruise around the world in a yacht you will i think you will i think you got it in you oh, yeah. and you're gonna call it dropping bombs it's a new it's a new uh <laughs> you know i got a boat out at lake mead it's called uh the, there's two jet skis called i forgot a name of it <laughs> um oh thing the boat's called two. petty cash but spelled c-a-c-h-e because i'm in the computer business yeah and the and the uh little jet skis are called chump change Chump oh, that's change. that's clever. Petty cash oh, and go. chump change. That's clever. So we had Minderella. Minderella was the boat, That's and we had. Um, yeah, but yours was two hundred feet. <laughs> yeah, we had what uh, the glass slipper was, was the, the helicopter because it was all glass. It was pretty cool, and then um, the Grand Duke was the chase boat, which was the guy who carried the slipper around looking for Minderella. Yeah, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, same thing. <laughs> now, did. Could you put shit inside the boat, like boats inside the boats? Uh, no. it, put them on the deck. Yeah. We did, but 200 yeah. feet is one of those huge ones. I want people to visualize. This isn't a boat. This is a ship. It, it was, was a good size. It had know, a crew of 16. It was a big size. Yeah. If you think about, I mean, wanting to go around the world, you know, I mean, we wanted to go and take some time off and spend in 30 years building a business. It was time to just relax and having... When you get that kind of, you know, you can do anything money with, why not have something big enough that, you know, you're not going to have to worry. I, we had a, my ex-wife on the boat. So, you know, I didn't 
want to see her every day. So you need a boat big enough that, you know, you can get lost on. So She had her own room. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. I'd like, you know, imagine what she was thinking. Because when you were with your ex-wife, were you building the business or building were you it. way before? Yeah, I'm And she it. was probably doing what my ex-wife would do. She doubted it would ever turn into anything. Yeah, she was, you know. Was it doing well all the time or no? Well, she didn't see a lot of them, and that's probably why the yeah, um, part was, of the reason the marriage dissolved, because he was building and he wasn't balanced, and that really was one yeah, of them. Lot yeah, of, a lot of, lot of work. Because they say the biggest revenge on an ex is get rich mm. or famous. Yeah. See, so I'm, I'm picturing you guys like, you know, all, you know, blue collar and then all of a sudden bang but that ain't how it was no. you, guys were, you guys were living no, large a for a while even without climb. selling oh we did well you, you know? got your own jet yes 200 foot boats how much is your house where's your house how many you got <laughs> are we here um, to talk about folks, our assets <laughs> no what i want what i want the drop bomb listeners to understand is it's like a freaking a life most don't live mm-hmm so it takes a lot of freaking hard work. Yeah, but you guys are so humble and nice. It doesn't, it's, it's not normal. And I will tell you, okay, again, I grew up, right, I was dyslexic. My dad struggled with alcohol and drugs. My mom, my entire yeah. family, uncles, aunts, you know, you name it, right? And uh, failed fourth grade. I had a child in eighth grade when I was 14. Damn. And, um, you know, I was the first to go to college in my family. So... You know, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon, didn't grow up, you know, with, with much uh, mentorship. It was all pretty much kind of figuring it out along the way. And so a lot of people, when they look at you, if you've had some wealth and, and then you go off and buy some fancy toys and whatnot, you know, ah, that jerk, that guy, you know. But I, I'm pretty proud of where I came from. And so if people want to have an issue with the fact that, you know, it wasn't handed to me, then that's their issue, right? So we've enjoyed it. We haven't shoved it in people's faces. You know, we've tried to <laughs> kind of be under the radar, kind of, um, so to speak. But you know, it's been it's been a great uh, reward for a life of hard work. So it took you thirty years to get to the exit. Pretty much, yeah. When what 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 age did you start? Like twenty eight, twenty four, twenty four. Yeah. And why that business? You know, it just happened to fall into it. I didn't know what I was doing either. I went out to Tell California. Tell them the story about how you got to California and how that motivated your... Yeah, you know, I mean, I was I was in... Uh, I was literally, I was in a bar in Maryland, drunkard and shit, just laughing my ass off at two in the morning at, you know, my buddy that got a beer thrown on him by a girl or something, you know, stupid. And as I was laughing... I remember thinking, wow, I laughed at the same dumb stuff last night and the night before. And I, like, this is old. I don't want to do this anymore. And so the next morning I went to my buddy. I said, hey, why don't we go cross country? Let's go west. Let's go. So we drove out the next day. Just got in a, our car and drove. Um, never forget, we went landed in New Orleans. Our first, we went down south and cut over, watched the Super Bowl. It was Denver Broncos against Washington Redskins. Um, the irony of that is I'm best buds with John Elway. Now I watched him, you know, lose to the Redskins and, um, and we drove across country, got to California. I was sleeping on the floor with five guys. We knew one guy and he had four other buddies. So we all went and we stayed there in a one bedroom for about a week. And then I knew a girl that lived in this little apartment next to the ocean. And when she went, she said, come and stay, don't sleep on the floor. So I did. And the next morning, I got up, I sat on a bench, just overlooking the Pacific Ocean by myself, right? Wow, look at these just beautiful people, big million-dollar homes, fast cars. I want this. You know, like, what does it take? And so I saw a man in his yard, and he was doing some yard work, and I walked up, and I said, tell me what it took to get this house. Like, I know I can do it. What did it take? He's like, Senor, I'm the gardener. He goes, I have no idea. He says, I think the guy's in real estate. I thought, damn, I'm going to get into real estate. And so I literally stayed. My buddy wanted to go home. He left the next day. We were there for two weeks, you know, and he went back. I became a waiter. Right? That was, that's the start of it all, right? 
Every great success starts. Yeah, and then yeah. I, got in the, I got in the lending. I became a broker and did that for 10 months and then started my own company from there. So, And that company became... Became Stern's, Stern's Lending. Stern's Lending, top in the nation. Yeah, we, we, we became the largest wholesale um, banker wow. in the country. Came, um, at one point, I think we were second largest lender in the country. And, um, and then uh, sold to Blackstone and had a minority share in Blackstone uh, or in uh, the company for four or five years, five years. And then that all ended last year which got me out of a non-compete. So I went back at it, you know, literally right after the undercover billionaire, you know, and building something from nothing, right, of, of, of starting over again. Um, I found it just, it, it brought me back. And, and I think what's interesting, and, and you know, you, you, you interview a lot of people that have had a lot of success, but a lot of times what I find is people when they get into their 50s and 60s, the older you get, the more conservative you get. I don't want to lose that, man. I, you know, I don't want to start over. I don't want to have to live like I did before. And um, I found that happened in 2007 and eight when the financial crisis hit and I lost everything pretty much. And I dug out of the hole and crawled back out. And I thought I never want to go through that. And then cancer hit me, right? In in when was that? Two thousand fourteen. Two thousand fourteen, and I thought, what I'd give to go crawl back out of those holes and fight again, the you know Wall Street guys, and like that was fun actually. It, you know, if you could just change your perspective in your mind, you know, and um, so when I did that show, I thought I want to do it again, and then I had my opportunity where I had a, my non compete went away. And so I went back at it. We started Kind Lending, and we're doing it again. Well, let's go back, though, because you you started your own company. That became Stearns. Then you sold that to Blackstone, made a ton of money. Then then you went on a boat ride for what, a little while, didn't you? About a year and a half or so, Yeah, right? so, so, so you went past all the way to today. I want to go back and say, <laughs> like, how did we build that? Why do you think yours became number one? What, what were you doing that perhaps other people, companies weren't doing you know and it's funny because when you look back on why companies succeed and why they fail when i when i see companies that have a great trajectory and what it is about it it's it, it's all culture it really is right it's like will you live and die for that company and so when i see you know our company i mean we had 1800 people when right before we sold the blackstone and the year we sold, we had five people leave that year. That's it, five people. And I say, why? Well, we cared. I mean, we absolutely got down to, I mean, Debbie Davis was our receptionist for 18 years, okay? When I came back, Debbie Davis came back with me, right? People want consistency, and they want to know you care about them. And it's so important to get to that place where, you do care, and nobody is above anybody else. That's the whole thing with, with our business is, I don't care if you're the president or you're literally the receptionist, right? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> matters. And so we ended up uh, really just living that, that and, and our company's called Kind Lending because that's what we really kind of, that's the mantra, right? It's just be kind. You don't have to be a jerk, you know? And so... You know, if, if you look at a lot of companies right now, what's happened is, and, and I'll tell you what's happening with a lot of, um, in my industry, when you go public, you have a new God, right? You got all of a sudden, you got to worry about analysts, you got to worry about, you know, investors, you got to worry about all these different people to please versus your employee. Okay. Now, while I have customers, my number one customer is my employee, right? Those people work their ass off every day. And they're in there giving most of their life into our organization. So I want them happy. That's it. And if they are happy, and I can tell when they're happy. I can look. It's 5 o'clock. No one's even looking at the clock, man. They're there. Oh, shit, i got to do one more thing. I'm gonna, it's going to take me about an hour and a half, and then I'll get out of here. I'm going to come in on Saturday just to help the customer. Everybody works when, when they have joy, when they feel it. You, you, you know what I'm saying? When you yeah. know you're doing something for a bigger purpose. 
So that's what this is about. It's not just about a job. It's about changing people's lives. It's about going out and making sure we're, we have a meeting right after this where we're helping get some uh, for every hour that our employee puts in by helping and doing service to others, we match that with money so they can go and give that to their organization, to their nonprofit. So things like this, so it's not just about, again, you're coming here getting a paycheck. I want your life changed, right? And when you do that, you'll stay. You'll work at the place. You won't, you won't sit there and say, I'm going to go across the street because I'm going to make another $10,000 a year. Hey, if I have a billion uh loan officers or brokers listening to this, what if they want to go start using kind lending? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we're about. You know, I, who should I they, who, how do they, how do they like get dialed in with you? Well, they'll go onto our website, kind lending, and they can get in and get to a, a, either an account executive or somebody that's in their area. But then what ends up happening is they end up getting to me a lot of times, or they end up getting to Mindy because we want them to know we care. We're flying out next week. I'm going to Atlanta to see a guy's shop. He wants. To, he's so excited to show me his shop. I can't wait to get out there and see it. So, and I, and we promote that. That's my job. <laughs> see, that's what I mean. Like you guys are nice. Like you can't wait to get out there and see it. I'd be thinking, send somebody out there. I don't need to see this shit. But you know what? You got, I got shit to do. I'm hey, freaking but loaded. But that is our shit to do, right? Because it's important to him. He's busted his ass his whole you life. How far that go. will go to that that oh, yeah. little act will go. And, and so, so I'm interested far. in seeing it. I care about, you know, and, and that, those are the type of things I think when I look back on why we uh, did as well as we did is we, I don't can't. All right, Maria Mayorga. Maria Mayorga was my, was my customer back in 1988. She has seven sons. I did loans for all seven of her sons. Gonzalo was her husband. Her dad was a uh, Mexican cowboy. Yeah. Every day, every week he'd come in and I would, I would write down all of his um, amateurs. I would amortize his loans because he would give money to some of the other cowboys out there in Mexico. And I would help. The whole family would come in. We have been to all their weddings. We've been to their funerals. We've been to everything. It's about, you, you know, you've got to really care. You talked about a friend of ours. You say some people are transactional and some people are about relationships, right? I think when you're about relationships, and it, and then you're authentic, okay? And then the rest takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. I would have to agree with that. <laughs> so is that how it was at Stearns also? It, was, it the, was until sold. It was that way. And then, you know, and then you get new owners in and they, they want to do it their way. It's okay. You know, it's different. And, and they think differently. They're not, they, they haven't been That's at it their whole life, you know? So... They, and, and I'm sure they did well with their investment because they just sold. So, uh, But also, you know, you look at Glenn. He put in his own money when things were going back wrong or south. Or he would keep, he wouldn't take pay check out of the company for his own self. He would keep it in and keep the value in. And so when everyone was going under, he had, had made some really smart decisions in 2007. Well, when you say paycheck, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in finance right and it wasn't just a paycheck a lot of my buddies were taking out tens of millions of dollars a year and 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 living real large right and we didn't that's what you mean not not like a ten thousand dollar paycheck i mean hundreds of thousands and millions that we could take we never did and you built the net worth up because in our business the more net worth the more credit lines you can have, the more borrowing power you can get. So I just reinvest it, reinvest it, reinvest it so that we ended up being able to fund, you know, $25, 30000000000 billion of loans, you know. Whose money is that? Which, which money? Being lent. Is it just bank credit? You just have a network of banks? What? So we'll take loans, we'll gather them, put them together on a credit line, and then we'll sell them at maybe $100 million at a time. And we'll sell those loans to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you know, the, maybe they're FHA loans or VA loans, but they'll go into securities and be sent off. So, you know, the more you can gather. So you figure if you're funding a couple billion dollars a month, let's say, you need maybe a billion dollars in credit lines, right? And then when I sell those loans, I make a small cut on each loan, and then I service those loans where I make a little bit off of off the servicing. A little fraction of the action? I was yeah. trying to think of the other one you'd said, but your little, cousin. Little piece for my niece. Yeah, that's 
<laughs> I had it. And I couldn't remember. Damn it. It's a little buzzing for my cousin. There it is. <laughs> um, so, okay. So, and you're about to do that again. So, so you believe that kindness, that deep down authenticity is, is the reason or one of the reasons that Stearns got so popular and big and became number one. All the other, all the other competitors couldn't figure out, just be nice. No. And if someone's listening to this and they own a plumbing company or a landscaping shop or a, you know, car dealership, how do you just make everyone feel good? Well, it's not about being nice. It's about people being, before profits is what you. Yeah, people before profits, and and we we say that, but it's really caring, right? It's really listening. And you'd mentioned something about the show. You said the lady on the show that was a little out there that I had to let go. You know, why were you so nice when you did it? You know, I would have ripped her a new one, right? And all that. And and there's a great example of, I, I, you know, she's already hung herself. I don't have to go out in front of America and make her look any worse than she already looks. It's, it's already been done, you know? And I would learn those things from buddies. Like I mentioned John Elway. I say, tell me your leadership style. When you would get just run over time and time again, you've been sacked five times. What do you do when you go back in the huddle? Are you yelling at the guys? What are you saying? He says, I didn't have to yell at them. They already knew. They already felt bad. I'd go in there and say a joke like, you guys all, are you mad at me? You know, why are you letting them through the line, right? You know, and so you learn from other people. I had, we had Richard Branson over our house one night for dinner, and uh, it was about one in the morning. We had had a lot of wine. I'm walking him to the car, and he gets to the car, and the poor driver has left the lights on, and the, and the, batteries, the dead. batteries dead. And he gets out. He's just pale white. He goes, Mr. Branson, you know, the battery's dead. And so I, like, take the old the matrix. matrix move, right? <laughs> I'm looking to see if he's got a kink. You know, his mouth Twitch. starts moving. He's twitching. Does he give a big sigh? Does he rip this guy a new one? What does he do? Right? I want to see what Mr. Cool does when he's got a little buzz on and he's pissed. He immediately turns to me. He goes, we need another bottle of wine, right? Like, <laughs> why do you got to make other people feel bad? You don't. So I try to take these messages from other people that I've emulated, that I look up to, and, and, and it's true. You don't, you know, people already know. So if you can live a life like that, and you can bring people under your, you know, network like that, then you get loyalty. You get people that are going to bust their ass for you. And that's what I think the difference is. It really is. You can, you don't have to be the best price in town. You know, you don't have to just lead by, you know, by only the dollar. I, I think that's where people go south when that's all they're thinking. You about. know, a lot of people in businesses are making a shit ton of money and they're miserable because the culture is just toxic. There's a lot of onboard terrorists and they have no support and they aren't being listened to and management won't take their suggestions. I mean, we call people when they're hired and say, hey, here's my cell phone. You ever have an issue? You ever need a question? You ever have any feedback? We want to know. If you ever get to a point where your immediate supervisor <coughs> isn't giving you the support you need or you're not getting the answers, call us. Here's Glenn's phone number. Here's mine. Call us. And, you know, and, and we don't take ourselves that serious, right? We have I mean, fun. Like, Brand, you look at Richard Branson. His whole culture is fun. It's built on fun. And he's had so great success. When Mindy came out, she was the chief happiness officer. So she's going around going, I'm the cheap ho, I'm the cheap ho. And I'm like, you can't be my cheap ho. CHO. It, it's cheap not happening. Ho. So we had to change her to the chief kindness officer, right? But people are laughing, having fun, making fun of themselves. And then, and if you can't do that, maybe it's not the right business to be in. Maybe you shouldn't work for us, you know? So. Well, you're going to, I would imagine, crush it again with that kind of culture. Yeah, it's going well. I mean, what it took us 15 years, last time took us 90 days this time to get wow. to same oh. numbers so just with your connections with relationships the relationships how yeah. important are relationships yeah. i mean these people we've worked together for 20 25 years and they all came back now what what happened when some something took a shit and you flew out to everywhere and made sure or, or you you flew to each person and said hey we're gonna either keep going or f figure out a way to stop yeah there was in 2007 that was, that was a bad time where you know i had a hundred million dollars of loans that had gone bad. They wanted me to buy back. We had class action lawsuits. We had I lost eighty five percent of my revenue. I mean, we were we were in a bad spot. You were crashing. Crashing. Yeah. And uh, Hard. so I took a clipboard, right? And I went out and I have thirty thousand square feet in that building. I need five. I'd go to the landlord. I've got thirty thousand. I need five. Are you on the? I'll work with you side. Or are you on the? 
you know, pound sand. pound sand side, which <laughs> side I'm cool because I got about 50 more people to go. I'm going to add up my check marks, you know, and I'd go down to the lawyer. Hey, you're going to sue me. And you got class action lawsuit. I go, how bad are you going to stick it to me? The guy, what are you talking about? I go, I don't have money for a lawyer. I just need to know, are you on the pound sand side? I'm going to stick it to you on the, I'll, I'll work, work it out with you. I went down the line on every single person. And when we got done, I didn't have one group that said pound sand, every single person. He never worked. hides. That's probably the one thing I admire most about him. He is not afraid to go straight into the storm. He goes head first. So I'll, I'll give you one last example because it's funny. To say, I was in uh, a meeting and I get a call from my biggest warehouse line. I was telling you, you need those lines of credit in order to fund the loans. If you don't have those, you're out of business. And so the guy that controlled all my credit line, I mean, he was the big, big guy. Um, he calls me, he says, hey, party's over. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, we're done. We're out of this business. He goes, we got 93 lines of credit. We're pulling all of them but a handful. We're getting out of this business. It's 2008. The world's blowing up, and we just aren't going to be in this business anymore. I said, okay, When? He says, next week. I said, I don't have time to get another line. You, you'll put me out of business. He goes, we can't be concerned about that. This is, you know, the worst financial crisis ever to hit, and we're pulling out. And I said, okay. Obviously, so, the agreements allow them to. No, I even said that. I said, what are you going to do when we get in a lawsuit and you're putting a 25-year business out of business? And I, he goes, That'll be chump change compared to what we're dealing with. So I'm sorry. So the next morning, 8.30 New York time, I called him back. His name was Bruce. And I said, hey, Bruce, you know, you said something to me that was uh, I, I heard yesterday, and I would like to talk to you about it. I, he goes, well, what's that? He goes, I said, well, you said you're get, you have 93 relationships. You're getting rid of all of them but a handful, and you're just done. I said, I want to talk to you about that handful. Okay. I said, but I want to look you in the eye. He says, okay. You're in California. I'm in New York. And I said, no. I said, I flew all night. I'm in your lobby. Can I come up and see you? And it was all about that, right? You got to get in front of people. You know, he kept us. He kept quicken. Kept two lines. And we obviously did all right. Yeah. You know? So did quicken. So did yeah. quicken. <laughs> it will, well, well. If you would have, you know, did what most people would do, which is basically put your head in the sand, fuck yourself, or put your head in the sand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people avoid problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you come, you go face onto them. But most people, when they when they're saying that, they would have just said, "Oh, this is bullshit," and you know, gave up or mf'd them. You just flew mm -hmm. out there and said, "Hey." See, I find most people what they do is they want to live in the world of maybe, because maybe means. Maybe it'll happen, right? What it also means is I'm not going to get no. Because no, like, what are you going to do then? Right? It's over. Well, I, I want to get to the no quick. Because then I can make, I can change that. You right? always said no is the beginning of a conversation. Yeah, no is the beginning of the conversation, not the end, right? We all, we well, if you're in a business you and I are in, you, you know, as far as just not taking no for an answer. But so many people live in that world of maybe. That may, you know, so they don't want to get to the real bottom line because then it means they got to really do something. And that's that fear of rejection, fear of, you know, what's going to happen if, if it doesn't work out the way I want. I want to know right away because then I'll figure out how to make it happen the way I want it. Well, before it started crashing, how, how many years of like fat times, good times? Like how long did it take you to start making real money? Well, it depends on what real money is. You, I mean, know, you know, more than like net personal, not the company. Because you know, these mortgage companies, you know, we're doing nine trillion, but like that just meant like value wise, it sounds bigger. Yeah. Because it's a lot of money, but I'm talking about the Stearns family. Well, I mean, again, you know, like if, if let's just say, I mean, to make what, like, if, what, you know, I don't like. No, I mean, money, well, here, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Cause, cause, you know, I'm blue collar. <laughs> so, like, for example, like, to most people, even a million dollars a year is a shit ton of money. But once you start to actually make some money, you realize, well, that's not really that much money. But it's comfortable. So, like, some people build a business and they take, you know, half million, million dollar salaries for, for 20 years. And they never, 
sell or exit or get these right. big massive chunks of money, but they've lived a nice comfortable life, right? So so how long did it take you cuz when you started, you said you were sleeping with a group of people, then you hung out at the at the beach apartment and then all of a sudden you're like, "Shit, I need to get into real estate." Well, so you got into real estate, then you said, I think 10 months later or something, you started your started company. Started our own business. Was, and, it, and I'm assuming it was Stearns then. Yeah, no, it was sort of. It was called First Pacific Financial, but it was the same corporation. We just but, changed the name. But you you didn't start as a loan officer? You couldn't start as a lender, can you? you no, you I was know. a broker. Yeah. So and I did my own loans. And then a year later, I went out and asked for a line of credit so I could become a lender, a million-dollar line of credit. <laughs> now, now, when you become a lender, a million dollars, all, all you can do is lend out the million, and then you're stuck? You can lend out the million and sell those loans and lend it out again. So usually you can lend it twice in a month. I got you. So you're, so you're, so you're lending $300,000 for this person, and then after the agreement, you, you sell that. Sell you get your money, money back. back. Gotcha. So you can usually turn it twice. So if you had a million dollars, you could lend two million in a month. And so if I had a billion, which I did, I could lend two billion. I could lend two billion in a month, you know. And so could you lend it to anybody you wanted to? I mean, theoretically, you could. But if you couldn't sell the loan, then you're s stuck. You own it. You own it, right? Somebody's buying those loans. They must be worth something. Oh, then they're not worth the hundred percent. They're worth maybe. 80. So you're losing 20% on that loan. So it's, that would be, uh, let's just say it wouldn't be good business. Did right? you see so. the big short coming or no? <laughs> yeah. Go please Google 2005. Okay. Glenn Stearns. And you'll see me on some talk shows saying this is going to pop bigger than anything ever. All right. And I mean, I ended up on MSNBC and CNBC and all those shows for figuring it out before anybody else would would talk about it and it was mostly greed people couldn't see past all the money everybody was making and i'm like these are the worst loans ever made this is horrible you know when you've got a loan you're giving somebody a one percent rate and the real rate is five or six or eight and that's all it's doing is it's negatively amortizing right so you might pay them two thousand but you really should be paying them five thousand a month it's just adding up onto their principal they were horrible loans. Not only that, everyone was getting loans without any merit. No, right. I knew, know. I knew, I, I, I want to say she was a stripper, but I knew a girl, pretty sure she was, she was a stripper. Out here. Yeah, she, they, she, she owned five houses. She just kept getting approved for all these houses. Right. As Everybody. a stripper, number one, not that there's anything wrong with that. At the end of the day, you can't verify that income, but she kept getting approved with no verification. Right. That was, that was the problem with those loans. Yeah, you know, no one and, had and any real stated. It was stated. It was all stated. And no what one. about now? How do you think it's looking now? Oh, it's much more I mean, today's regulated. loans are, are solid, rock solid. You know, it's not Because they be drop problem. those rates pretty big. Well, but they're all, they're all, you have to qualify for that loan. So the people that are getting a loan actually have proven they have a job that's it's stable enough to pay back that income. And they're not doing two and three and five loans unless they've got qualified individuals in there that are renting, you know, so it's, it's a different world. How do you do, how do you do the big jumbo loans? Like if someone wants a $7 million house, what, what do they have to put down? Yeah. That, we don't do those. You know, those are the banks. Too risky. Yeah. Well, no, there's not a market for them right now. And the, there used to be a market to trade in that right now. It's all your big banks. I mean, I mean your deposit banks, right? They're the ones that are doing those loans for their customers. So that's something that our industry has kind of shied away from in the last 10 years. And we're mostly doing loans we can sell to the, you know, government backed companies like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Okay. So, so how long were you number one? Like, you know, years and years, I imagine it was yep. a 30 year span. <coughs> it took well, a while to get there. Yeah, say, I mean, let's in, say five or 10 years to build it up. In the beginning, I knew I could never compete with those big guys. I just, I didn't have the the bandwidth. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the connections. So I got into other things, right? I got into a government contracting where I became a, a contractor that did all the settlements for, um, for FHA, the HUD loans, the government-owned loans. And then I became an auditor for HUD. And I audited all the other mortgage companies. So I became the largest auditor in the country for HUD. I became the largest HUD settlement provider for HUD. I did 75% of every loan sold by the government. I escrowed them. Yeah, but that must mean you guys were killing it financially. You guys were all making money. 
I was killing it in those government uh, contracts. I was a tiny lender. I, did, I had lots of companies. I've always had a lot of companies. And, and so that company just chugged along until about 2000 I, in maybe two or three, and then it started growing. And then I got out of the government contracting space because I was a large mm-hmm. contractor, and the government wanted only small business contractors. So that kind of, you know, I kind of had to roll out of that and ended up into just focusing only on lending. And then, you know, we just start to really grow the lending business. And then all of a sudden it all crashes, you know. And, and that it, was in 08. In 08. And after I pulled out of that, because what happened was when it all went down, when we were on the ground, <laughs> all my competitors went out of business at the same time. So in November 07, I opened five offices from failed companies. And everybody said, why would you open now? I said, I would never get this talent, ever. I said, I'm just going to roll the dice and see if the market picks back up, but I'll have all these talent if I can hold them for a little while. And then in 08, I did the same thing, opened five more offices with all this talent. And then we opened, I think, 100 and 09 and 10. So then it just started to go through the roof, you know, and then we became pretty dominant. And you and, and while you were dominant, you were comfortable. You were getting paid. In other yeah. words, you weren't you weren't you weren't some struggling founder the whole time, then got a big fat payday. You you were comfortable making money on the way up and then a big fat payday. Right. I mean, we were comfortable meaning we could have pretty much anything we wanted. Before you sold. was all I mean, but he It's he's all relative. He's always <laughs> been frugal and tight. He's not a big when he spends, he'll he'll go for it, but he's r- tight and frugal all the time. All the time. True. Why do you? Why, why do you think you're that? All way? the time. Does that bother you? Sometimes, yeah. Okay, this is kind of a funny story, and he doesn't like this, but we had a Bentley. 2007 hit, and to get home, we'd go through a toll exit. Glenn said, "Stop taking the toll exit. We're cutting back pennies." It was a two dollar toll exit, and I'm in a Bentley, Every penny counts. and he wanted me to drive the long way because it was saving two dollars. I was sending a message. <laughs> Slow down your spending. You got to think differently. <laughs> did you do it? Uh, Hell no. <laughs> yes, yeah, because like, like I tell Melissa I sometimes, you know, s- slow down the spending. She loves to shop that girl. <laughs> and sometimes I'll say, babe, like, we're, you know, we're trying to get here. Like, slow that down. She doesn't listen. No. Nah. Of course, you know, she's not that bad either. I, 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 I got, I make her think she's bad so she doesn't get bad. You know what I mean? That's what he does. He does yeah. the same thing. She was I'm like, I do you realize very that bad I go, at Costco. I've never but. I don't go to Neiman's, I don't go to Barney's, I will shop at boutiques, I will go to Costco, that's my favorite store. I've we lived in Jackson Hole, so the only right, store was Kmart. All right, let's move it along. Let's give these how people. But he'll give me the about. big gift. I won't buy them for myself. He'll give me the big gift and I I'm I'm really We good. do. Yeah, no, but Where did, where did you guys meet again? Now again, La, if you guys here, are watching Las the video. Vegas. You guys are watching the video. She looks familiar because she used to be on TV, news, uh, news shows, KPL entertainment, actress. Entertainment Tonight. She's been in Princess da, da, Diaries. Da, 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 da. Yeah. That, that deal? Yes. I yeah. was next to Mary Hart. I've been on Oprah like five different times. Yeah. That's kind of where I was discovered, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, when, I first, when, when you guys first walked up, I'm like, why does she look so familiar? <laughs> I, I think it was Entertainment <laughs> Tonight. Were you on there a lot? No, I Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it was in that was a while ago. So, then, so you guys met here. We, we met did. here at the Palms. At the Palms. Mm-hmm. Just random? Random. Set up date or bumped into each other? I was there covering a lighthearted feature story for the morning news, KTLA, and he was there in a production venue for a um, video DVD thing that he was doing. And um, we actually met at the blackjack table. He was at a different table. I was at my table, and he was over making a lot of noise. But I had my girls and gays, and I was having a good old time, and we were just winning and having a real good night. And then... He, I invited him to sit down in the one rotating seat on the table, and he brought his energy over. And actually, Brad, I, <laughs> when I, I said that day, I'm like, I am so happy being single. I don't ever want to get married. I've got a great job, great paycheck. Good, I'm doing so much well. For that. Great friends. Isn't it always when you're just like, you're not even looking? <laughs> That's it wasn't, right. It wasn't looking. And he was wearing sunglasses. I'm like, he is such a Hollywood. He's so Hollywood. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was at two minutes of time when it was in. It was like P. Diddy was hot with this. Anyway, yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. Sunglasses cool. inside, you mean? Yeah, oh, like yeah. the light, you know, the light shaded, kind of mirrored Cartier, you whatever. Were cool. It was like, you are such a goofball. And that was kind of the. But then but I, I left five in the morning, just was walked it? out. And um, I think we exchanged first names. And how much were you gambling? Not a lot. I mean, I don't remember, you know. Enough. We weren't well, on you, a big. We weren't at a big money table. It yeah, was just you, a fun table. You guys never gamble crazy, do you? No, not crazy. But but yeah. So a few days later, I was watching the news and I saw her. I'm like, it looks like the girl I was sitting next to. And so I whipped her a little email, sent it to the viewer email, and at the news station, I had no idea, you know. And she didn't answer me back. I was like, kind of rude, huh? You know. <laughs> so I called viewer hotmail. Hey, I'm having a party at Jimmy Buffett. Why don't you come on out? And uh, so she made it out. And that was... That it was, was more for met. Jimmy Buffett, because I'd always wanted to see Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> uh, and, that, and that's been forever ago? How I'll tell you what, what got me about Glenn, because the first dinner we went to, uh, we sat down and we had... He talked about his mom, and he talked so highly of his ex-wife. And I will tell you that... A man who speaks highly of his ex-wife, no matter how bad it went, to me has a has gets good marks in my book. That shows integrity. That shows honor because the worse you speak about the relationship that failed, the worse it looks for you. I didn't want to be with that kind of a guy. You know, and I just he was like, Look, she's the mother of my kids. She will always come first in that department. It didn't work out, but I have the utmost respect for her. And I just said, Wow, now that's class. That's real class. And I appreciated that. And he loved his mom. She had passed away two years before we met. And he just, he and his mom were real tight. And I just, there were there were character check marks that he had that really impressed me. So he's always had that integrity. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> he's a Casanova. Yeah. Huh? Uh, but, but <laughs> yeah, he is. He, if you were wearing sunglasses, Glenn, <laughs> trust, Again, I said trust it was a, me. It you, was a two minute. Oh so, my God. You know, no, it just, it was a, if you miss that, you know, oh, that, what do you call it? That you'll fad. never live it down. Never. It was pathetic. <laughs> hey, so so let me ask you a question. Is that why, number one, the company's called Kind because you believe in that, right? Mm -hmm. That's why it's called that. Right. Yeah. And number two, do you believe if somebody's like struggling, their business is struggling, <laughs> just starting to like kind of install that kindness, if there's already yeah. poisonous culture, how do you like, do you got to clear it out, start over? Well, what would you guys do? If you See, took over a company and there and there wasn't that kindness instilled in the in the in the culture, well, you know your list, your number ones. That's kind of how we operate. And ethical integrity, those are things that if 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 the top isn't, the company isn't. Like it has to start at the top. If those philosophies aren't in place at the top, it's going to permeate and trickle down to the rest of the company. And Glenn starts with that. He leads with that. And it just, uh, you attract what you put out. I always believed in the But I was able to watch how we had something. We had lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. And then when it changed hands, things changed, right? I mean, that's, it's, that's the way it always works when you sell a company. And I got to see how people were more concerned about the executive team. And we need to make sure they look good. And we will, you know, we're going to reprimand you if you try to talk bad or you bring up a something that didn't, is broken. And you're, that's a reflection of the team. It was such the opposite of what you need in a company. We reward people. If there's a mistake and you find it, we're going to thank you. We want you, we've got to find that as fast as we can. It's not a reflection of the executive team. If something's wrong, <clears throat> we're going to make mistakes. So let's let's reward people the quicker we can. But to watch that go from this fear-based mentality of it's a bad reflection if there's something wrong. There is why you want to sweep it under the rug. It doesn't make any sense. So we've had to come back and redo a lot of those things and get people back on track and say, don't be afraid to bring up something. It's okay. And if you think you want to go straight to around my back and go to somebody else, talk to him. I don't care. There's no, there's nobody here worried about why you're talking to him and her, you know what I mean? It's just, there's a lot of those things that happen because of the politics and the business. And we're trying to remove all that. Let's just get to the solution as quick as we can. 
And let's make sure people are rewarded for busting their ass. When you do that, it works easier, faster. We say when we know, we grow. If we don't know, we can't, how can we grow? We can't grow from everybody patting us on the back. So when we know, then we can change and we can, of course, you know, we've been very open about that. Like I said, we give our phone numbers. We say, call us. We, and another thing is it, what an important philosophy that Glenn instituted <coughs> when he was in the first company was when someone left, a good employee left, you walk them out the door. You say, thank you. The door is always open. We had so many employees that left because they thought the pastures were greener and they discovered they weren't and they'd come back. And that was kind of the, the, the whole mentality is like. If you watch some companies, you know, you leave, you're the enemy, right? Why are you going to shut that door and seal it forever? Why don't you thank them for the hard work that they put in and be happy that they're going to go off and maybe get a better job? Maybe they, you know, maybe now they get to run a division or do something that you didn't have the space for them in your company. Why shouldn't you be happy for them, for their evolution? And if a bunch of people leave at one time, why aren't you looking inward and saying, what are we doing wrong? Is there something going on in that division where people are really unhappy? We need to fix it instead of we're going to sue that group for leaving. And I see this happen. I think, wow, how can people be that short-sighted? If someone's leaving our organization, I hope it's that they go on to do something great. But if a lot of people are leaving, it's us. It's our problem. It's not their problem. Where, where do you think you got this from? It's just, it's just common sense, Brad. We talked about this. Remember earlier? It's common sense. <laughs> well, it is, but why is it not so it's common? It's not common. <laughs> it's it's yeah. sense, I, but it isn't as common as you would people, think. Because people, you know, are, you got to take accountability. And if, <coughs> uh, if people are leaving our company, we're doing something wrong. Let's just figure it out and change it. I love when Domino's, I think it was Domino's, came out with that. That ad campaign, our pizza sucked for a while. We're real sorry. We, we fixed it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that, be, just be, be up front, be transparent, and move on. Who cares? You now, know? now, you're jumping on Clubhouse here and there. Are, are you on too? I've been on, yeah, a few times. I've only seen you on there. You're, I was been on with Elena and Grant <laughs> when they brought us in. Yeah. Well, but you're a handful. So, like, you, <laughs> you're, you're, but it's, I mean, she doesn't, Little like, hand. you're not filtered. Like, I like, I like people like this because she's like me. She'll just say what she thinks. Yeah. Do you? Or yeah. Or do you, do, you, do you filter a little I bit? I sometimes can get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, but on Clubhouse, it's perfect. because yeah. Because I think the world loves real people. Yeah. Right? They're tired of And they the, can tell. They can tell. And they can tell when they're listening more than they're, you know, watching some content on social media. Like, Clubhouse is like, they're listening to you. Mm -hmm. The other day, you guys know Jesse Itzler? I know that name. Yeah. He, he's married to Sarah, Sarah Blakely. Oh. He, they own part of the Atlanta Hawks. Yeah, um, okay. He started Marquee Jet. Right. right. Oh, cool yeah, dude. yeah, yeah. He used yeah. to be a rapper. <laughs> he's got like curly hair. He's out of New York. He's just a cool dude. He was in one of those pitch rooms where these people were pitching. And uh, I, you might even have been in one of those rooms, Glenn, where, where uh, this one guy was just being a dick. And he, so he tells this kid, young entrepreneur, give us 10,000. There's four of us. One you know, basically started Android and this one, and they're all, you know, they're worth hundreds of millions and hundreds of millions. They kept telling this kid that like, you know, you don't know who we are. We're, we're, we're huge. And so the guy says to Jesse, so what do you think of this deal? Jesse thinking probably he'd back him up. Jesse says, oh, I'm just listening. I'm just learning. He goes, no, no, no. Tell him, tell us what you think. Jesse goes, well, I mean, no disrespect, but like, how are four people that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, worried about this kid's 10,000? What are you going to split it four ways? So you're worried about 2,500 bucks? Why don't you just help the kid? That's nice good. Kid. Yeah, but that's, that's the truth. That's mm -hmm. the truth. So again, why if you have hundreds of millions of dollars when, when you don't even need hundreds, that's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Why would you be busting a kid's balls for 10 G's? Yeah. Do you think you would? Are there people out? I mean, you guys know a lot of freaking successful people. Are there dickheads like that at that level? There are at every level. Money right? doesn't buy class. I think money reveals who you are at the core. Money doesn't buy class. That's a good one. Yeah. And I think that when you look at, you know, the intent of what people are on there for, um, you know, a lot of people are there because they're, they're, they've, they've got something to sell, right? And then... You know, I think there's a lot of people that it's funny because people always say, 
I, I always, I was on a lot of nonprofit boards back in my time, and I always became the membership chairman. And they, you know, it was because I was in this weird spot where most people are older, and they couldn't get down to the younger people. And, and the younger people would say, how do you know all of these <laughs> icons in our, you know, yeah. in around the, the community? I said, well, I just asked if they wanted to go to lunch. I'd ask if, you know, I could just pick their brain. And it became real easy to understand the difference. People that were, you know, starting out thought they'd never want to talk to me. And these older guys... They just would love to give advice, but no one's asking them, right? And they're not going to go, hey, here's my advice. It's free. What Clubhouse has done is allowed people that really, maybe for no reason, and this is what I like going on, I just want to help you out. Uh, just to your point of what Jesse said, just help the kid out, man, right? You know what I mean? And I love that aspect. Just give some advice. And I'm not here to preach down. I always, I, I, it makes me a little nervous about sounding preachy. Here's what happened to me. I got my ass handed to me. I hope it doesn't happen to you. I like that kind of communication, right? Where let me see if I can help save you a little, you know, time of beating your head against the wall because this is what happened. And then if you can learn off of somebody else's mistakes, I think, you know, obviously you can, you can make it a lot faster or you can avoid a lot of pitfalls. And there's a lot of people out there that just would love to give their advice They've had a, you know, a lifetime of experience. We were at Love dinner it. the other night, and Glenn, we, were, we went out to dinner, <laughs> which was so nice, and these young kids were sitting behind him, high school kids, and the guy came over, and he's like, are you Glenn Stearns? And, you know, it was really, it was so endearing, because he had heard his voice, and he's like, no, no, they can't be. And there were three of them, and two of them were bold enough to come over and ask, and one of them had chickened out. He was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. So the other two started the conversation. He gave them their email. He's like, hey, I'm, if you need some advice, I'm here. They were like mind blown. And then the other kid came over. He's like, I was do chicken, you know, but he got in the conversation. But if you're chicken to ask, the answer is always no. You're, you're never going to get an answer if you don't ask. So these kids were like. Yeah, they'll, go, they'll go far. They, you could tell. And Glenn's like, I, you have a, he could see it. Glenn's got a good blink, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Where you just immediately you can tell something about a person. He's really good about that, like first impressions, first instincts, and uh, that's a good book if you hadn't read it. And um, he's always been really good at the blank. But and I think that when you're looking at wanting to help people, you know, you ask what is it about. And I've had so many times I've wanted to be that mentor to people. I enjoy it. And um, after they get to know you, then it's like, well, you know, I was kind of hoping you could lend me a hundred thousand, you know, you go, look, now I'm a bank. Do you want me to be a mentor to you or a bank? There's a difference, right? And when I was going through my tough times in 08, I had two amazing mentors of mine, George Argyros and Robert Day. George owned the Seattle Mariners, he owned Cal Airlines. Robert Day owned TCW. He's the head of the Keck Foundation, both multi-billionaires. They're both, you know, a lot older than I am. And um, they came to me in 08, and they said, hey, we want to buy half your company. We know you're struggling. We know you're on your knees. Let us in, and we'll help you out. And I mean, here are my mentors, the guys I loved, and they're coming to help bail me out, right? Like, this is what the friendship was all about. Just, you know, we want to help you out, Glenn. I said, I appreciate it. There's not enough money in the world. I said, my friendship is worth more to you, more to me than any amount of money. And I said, I need it. I want it, but I'd rather be friends. I love what we've got. And to this day, I mean, they're still the most amazing mentors to me. And I never let them in. I stayed firm, grew, and, that, and Robert's always, I wish I had talked you into it. You know, it's fun. They don't really care. They got more money than they need. It was always just about helping, but I think when you when you blur that line <coughs> from being a friend to having getting involved with money and involved, it gets difficult. Does you know? it? Yeah, I think so. It, it see, you would think. I mean, that's common sense, especially if it's like not going so well. Glenn's you know, always been very responsible. He doesn't want to be beholden. He doesn't want to be responsible for other people's investments in the sense that he says. 
you know, you got to know the risks you're getting involved. I'm doing this over here. I think it's a good deal. If you want to get in, you know, that's that's. And I've done that. I've said to my friends, all right, look, we're started a bank. If you want in, great. Are you willing to lose all your money and still be friends with me? If you are, maybe you can think about investing. That's the disclosure I'm going to start using. <laughs> but I mean it. I don't don't be mad at me because I'm going to try my butt off to make it work too. But I'm not the one running the show. I'm an investor as well in some of these deals and and, and the big ones. But if you're not willing to lose it and look me in the eye and know that I tried my best, then please don't do it. You know, and my friendship's worth much more than any money, you know? And so, you know, we've had a few deals. Again, I'm a large investor, largest investor in a couple of them. And, and some of my friends came in alongside of me, but I just said, don't do it because I'm doing it. I might screw it up. You know, I might did, have. Did they screw up? No, they're doing great. Oh, he's got some really good ones. <laughs> well, so so what What about the, when you got the big call, the big cancer call? What'd that do? Like, did that scare the shit out of people? Oh, and, that, derail us. that derailed us yeah. a little bit. I mean, again, it's what, it's what what were what were you what were your symptoms like? How did you know the? He get turned. F- it was right when he turned fifty, and he was feeling kind of had headaches, was feeling kind of low energy, and he had a swollen lymph node gland under here. And they tried antibiotics, did a CAT scan. Thought he thought, God, I have Lyme disease. Do I have mono? I, you know, they tried all. They, they were checking all the boxes, and none of them were coming up. And so we were in D.C. for a, um, an event that we support, the Horatio Alger Foundation. Glenn is a member. It's a very distinguished. It's like the equivalent of being knighted in the United States. It's a really honorable organization. And we had just been there for the weekend, and he was supposed to fly off to Fiji the next day with his YPO group. And we had had dinner with the Cheneys, Dick and uh, Lynn Cheney. We'd known them through friends. And um, we just we were about to fly off, and I, I, I asked Dick, I'm like, Glenn's not... He's, do you have a doctor? Can you, can you help us out? Can, can you give us a recommendation? He immediately hooked us up with his doctor in D.C. It's also Hillary's doctor, so she goes on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the next thing you know, he's in getting a, a guy did a scan on his throat. He's like, hmm, this tissue here, over here's good. This side, no, nah, it doesn't look so good. I, I want to do a biopsy on the, and And that kind of mm-hmm. was the... But when that moment came where he said cancer, right, it was really, because I was, I was, I just had uh, some people that wanted me to do a book, and I had the lady on the phone, and I said, let me get through this, let me call you right back after I get through it. So when I came out of there, I said, look, I just found out I have cancer, I'm going to have to postpone this book, and she goes, Glenn this is going to be the best chapter, you know, <laughs> which is true, you know, and the reality is it makes it, you know, there's a whole door or window or whatever you want to call it. You never even know exists. I walked by this my whole life. And when, when cancer came, it opened and I just saw gratitude. I saw love. I saw a lot of things that became so much more important than Building. Can I build a bigger business? Can I do all those things that you, you hear the cliche when you're on your deathbed? Are you going to be thinking, could you you know work more, all that stuff? Well, luckily what cancer did for me is got me at 50, prime, building my business time. It's like, I don't give a crap about building a business. So I got through it, took months of radiation, chemotherapy, and all that good stuff. But I was like, let's go. Get in the boat, go around the world. Let's go have some fun. I don't care about building a business. You know, it doesn't matter. Sold, left, spent that time with the family, and um, and it was perfect. And then I started rolling, doing really well <clears throat> with all the toys because now I got all the money, right? You know, it's not sitting, and now I'm invincible again because cancer's gone. I got my buddies down in uh, Costa, Rica. Costa Rica in a fishing boat. I'm, I pull into MD Anderson. Hey, can you hurry up and do my scan quick? I got to get out of here. You know, I'm going... All right, they do my scan. I fly down to Costa Rica. I get down there. The phone. Uh, can you call us back? It's MD Anderson. Oh man, they don't. They're not here for the Christmas card, right? Like they want something. And I ended up calling them back, and they say we see something. We're not sure. Well, it came back, you know. And I go, man. So every time I start to get a big head, you know, 
If you believe in God, well, he's there clobbering the <laughs> shit out of me every time I get too big for myself. Let me know who's boss because it's happened to me every time where when I do start thinking maybe I am a little special. <laughs> no, you're not. It's easy to drink that. <laughs> no, that, you're not. That makes yeah. sure. Yeah, so I'm, I've been grateful for that. It's put me in my place where I needed to be, you know, and then that second go around was, was kind of tough. So, you know, and then I said, forget it, man. Let's go do this TV show. And, 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 and that to me, when we get back to the beginning, the first question you asked about the television show, why in the world? Here I've made it. I've rung the bell. I've got everybody in my circles thinking I'm the most successful guy out there. I got names on buildings. I got it all. Why am I going to go out in front of the world and see if I can do it and most likely fail in 90 days? Okay. And this was his idea. This Why? Was, this was his creation. Would I want to do that? And at the time, I thought I really want to, I want to dig down. I want to get myself in a hole again because I believe it's not who you are. You think about a lot of us. When we are doing well, boy, aren't we great citizens. Look at all we donate. Look at how we can do all this great stuff to people. Who are you when your back's against the wall? Who are you when everything's been stripped away and they're going to take your name down and, and now you got to fight for the reality of what you stand for, right? That's the person I like to see about myself. And so when I did it in 07, I was proud of who I was and how I came out of it. And then again and again, well, now I'm doing it in front of the world with TV cameras watching me. I, there's a moment or two in that show where I sit and I can see what I was thinking. I know. I'm going, this was a dumb idea. Like, I'm going to fail in front of the world. You know? And, and that's what I like. When it gets down to it, it's, it's not about the success or failure. It's about trying. It's about giving it your all. And I wanted my kids to see that. I don't care if I made a million-dollar business. I wanted to show that no matter how many times you fall, man, just get up, keep going. And so that's what this was about. Just don't give up. Let yourself, you know, just feel the pain. Don't hide. And so I enjoyed that, right? I enjoyed that feeling of being scared to death. I'm going to look like a fraud. You and I talked about this outside. I'm going to look like I don't, I mean, I didn't deserve it the first time. And there's proof because I'm not going to make it. All those feelings, that's like the devil over here, right? It's the people telling you it's okay to give up. It's okay not to succeed, right? I like fighting those people, right? I like getting that out of my brain. So this was what it was about to me. It's about living again. And that's life to me is just putting it on the line. Not doing something stupid. Here, I got all my money. I'm going to go put it on red, see if I can double it. No, I mean just feeling and fighting. And so that's what it meant to me, you know, and it did it. And I'm proud of what happened. You know, it was, it was definitely much more difficult than I thought. But I, but I enjoyed the, the struggle, the pain, the outcome, you know. It turned out well. And that was the impetus for building it again. He wanted to do it differently this time on his terms and create the culture and the environment that he once captured and change people's lives. And do it in a mortgage business again, yeah. Do it again. Do it again. You're going to show whoever screwed up over at Blackstone. That, <laughs> huh? I wouldn't say they screwed up, but well, they're, they're, you, you know, can say it. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 had, they did. And, and a lot of times those big companies that come in and buy shit, they don't they – don't, they think they know everything because they got their freaking Harvard, Yale bean counters. And guess what? It's not about counting beans sometimes. Yeah. It's culture. It's freaking, you know, it's, it's, it's legacy school, knowledge. It's I, all kinds of shit. I think the school of hard knocks gives the best degrees. I think life gives you the struggle he's had that he's overcome. Like even, you know, you talk Blackstone or these big corporate uh, or environments. He's an entrepreneur at the soul. He's been the one that went in the trenches when sh shit turned bad. When everything was down, he was there. He's not working with other people's money. He's working with his own hard-earned hard earned living, and that's what he put on the line. That's the risk that he was willing to take. He was the one that shouldered everything when everyone was ready to give up, and that's the school of hard knocks that he graduated from, and I think that's a much more powerful degree. Mm. So, folks, if you guys are dreaming of a big life, He's lived it, lost it, and lived lived it again, <laughs> and 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 it's about to live it again and again. Now I'm sure you guys have put money away to where it's indestructible. What type of investments should people be looking at right now? 
what what's the smartest most ROI on your money you can get right now? Mm. Being being somewhat conservative. Yeah, you know that's tough. I don't know. I mean, you know, real estate obviously is something that I've always believed in, but it's priced pretty high right now. The stock market, I believed in, it's priced pretty high right now. You know. So what would you do if you had a little extra coin? Just save it. Wait. Yeah, probably wait. I, I'd probably still buy some real estate. I mean, and know that it's going to go down, it's going to go up, it's going to, you know, if you can find income producing property that can give you a good enough return, you feel good about, uh, depending on how much money you have, of course. But, but um, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's hard. I mean, you know, I I I. I was, everybody's asked me to invest in different companies again because I've done a lot of investing in a lot of companies. And I said, I'm investing in myself right now. I'm going back at it in my mortgage business and I'm putting a lot of my effort into that. And that's, you know, that's my, my one investment right now. Yeah, but this time you don't have a hundred bucks in your pocket. You right. Know, and, no, and nobody to call. How's your, how's your guys' Rolodex? I mean, you guys know princes and... <laughs> freaking movie stars and celebrities it's pretty deep it's kind of like yours but i mean like do you guys yeah mine's yours I, is pretty I don't deep. I, but you're probably like me i don't call like no. i'll never call you guys with some sort of offer or bullshit oh i don't do that i call to say do you want to go have a beer yeah go out and <laughs> dance on a table you know how important is proximity last question only because you were telling me the story last night where you pulled the boat in <laughs> you know first of all pulling in a 200 foot yacht into a marina and a harbor you're already at a much higher level than most people or you or th- you wouldn't even be there hanging out at a bar you know who randomly walks in that type of thing that proximity how important do you think that is um i don't know if i understand your question but is it important to like put yourself in situations to meet high level people yeah cuz cuz you you were telling me a story last night you met someone at that marina that you were considering being a member at. Now you're already high level, but if there's somebody that's wanting to get higher level, I always tell people go to where they are. Like you were at the bar and then you met the dude. And then, and then next thing you know, you're taking a tour and then it turned out to be, I thought you said, like like, like like fourth to the the throne. Now he's giving you spots in Monaco uh, better than your buddy, you know, stuff like that. Like if you were not that bar, if you weren't in that particular area, you would have never met him. No. And, uh, you know, again, I, 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 you know, to me, what it, where it started was in my local community, I would go to, you know, some of these events and just want to be at a table with some people that, you know, that, that were very, uh, that were probably the, the pillars in the community, right? And you get to know them. And then they say, hey, why don't you come with us? We're going hunting in Spain. And, okay, we'll go with you. And, and then you meet you know, some pretty important people. And then you keep meeting. And I didn't do it to try to climb my way up a ladder to, you know, to meet the next person, to meet the next person. It, it be, you became part of the circle. You weren't, I wasn't there to to move up another to network. Room. Yeah. And so I never asked for, you know, anything. And, and we would just become friends with people. And then, and now when I look back on it, um, you know, we have access to everywhere and it has enhanced our lives, right? But it's not because um, we're borrowing money from somebody or we're, you know, investing with people. It's just because we've been able to do some really cool things, you know? And so it is definitely important if you want to grow, you got to put yourself out there and get to a place that you, you know, we call them basement people and balcony people, right? You got people that are either going to lift you up or people that are going to pull you down. And we all know when we're with the balcony people and we know when we're with the basement people, you know? You know those people. You just stay out of the basement, you know, and keep mm. keep pulling, finding people to help lift you up. Hey, man, I say wealth will get you access because if you have a bunch of money, you know, you get a lot of access. But mm-hmm. the access will get you wealth. If you hang around the right people, but you're doing it the right way, you see those people walking in, trying to network and, you know, slime their way in. They, they don't last in those. Those right. are the basement people that are on the balcony because sometimes the basement sometimes people are in. on the balcony. Yeah. Relationships last. Investments can blow up. You know, if you keep a relationship alive, we value the relationships. We've had much more than the investment. And that's where we invest our time. And it, it has a great ROI. 
man, you guys are like real nice, loving, kind. <laughs> and if I don't get you to your appointment, you're going to be pissed at no. me. So <laughs> we'll folks, be kind about it, though. <laughs> folks, they got to go. I wish I keep talking. I appreciate you guys coming in. Thanks, Brad. And you guys go follow them at Glenn Two N Stearns on S-T-E-A. Instagram. Mindy with a Y Stearns mm-hmm. on Instagram. Plus, you can Google them. They're all over the place. Go look at their boat. Just Google the boat. <laughs> Leave They're unbelievable, out. man. You, you you guys are just freaking, you know, inspirational. I hope I end up as sweet and nice as you when I got a billion dollars. Anyway, <laughs> till next time, kids. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.